Hello, good morning scientists. My name is Courtney. I am a member of the education department here at the aquarium and I'm so glad I'm joined by you today for Aquarium Online Academy. Uh, so before we get started, I'd like to know during our program today, you have any questions or anything you want to add to the conversation, please feel free to text us at 562-286-1838. The more you get involved, the more enjoyable, the more fun this program can be, so please do it if you can. Um, but if you're watching later on and you have a question or something you'd like to add, or maybe you just don't want to get on the phone right now, that is A-OK. -okay. You can always email us. You can send uh, your feedback or question to live at lbaop.org. So again, these, this number and this email address will be down at the bottom for most of our program. But let's get into it. So today, we are learning about a really cool group of animals called crustaceans. These are animals like crabs, lobsters, shrimps. Maybe some of you are getting hungry right now. Yeah, a lot of us eat uh, crustaceans. A lot of animals in the ocean also eat crustaceans. So they can eat a lot of things themselves. But what do all these things have in common? Why are they all a part of this group? Well, let's take a picture. Let's take a look at maybe some pictures of them, see if we can notice something similar about them. Ooh, so this is a squat lobster. It's got a lot of legs, big bread. Hmm. Maybe there's another crustacean we could take a look at. Try and see if we can find a pattern. Ooh. And we've got another lobster here. Let me walk to the side so you can see this big guy. Again, legs all down the bottom. They have antennas like we saw in that squat lobster. You know, one thing I'm noticing all over their body. What is that stuff? That looks like a shell to me. Good observation, Kelly. So do you know the word crustacean actually means hard shell? So that is one of the big things that all crustaceans have in common. They have a hard shell all over their body. Let's see if I can find... Oh, in fact, I have one of these hard shells with me. So this is another lobster. This is what's called a molt, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I want to talk before that, how having a hard shell might help these animals. Well, what do you think? Why would you want to be hard on the outside? How could that help us? Well, for a lot of these crustaceans, it helps give them protection. So like I said earlier, a lot of animals like to eat crustaceans. Us included, as well as other animals in the ocean. So having a hard shell to protect them can make it a lot harder for those animals to eat these crustaceans. So that's actually an example of something that we always try to talk about here called an adaptation. So an adaptation is something that an animal has that they're born with. It's either a part of their body or it's something they have an instinct to do and helps them survive. So for these crustaceans, our crabs, shrimps, lobsters, uh, barnacles, we're going to learn about a few of those too. They have these hard shells on their body and that's an adaptation that helps them survive. But what else does a hard shell do for our crustaceans? So they have this hard shell all over their body. Well, what do you think their body would be like if that shell disappeared? Do you think they'd be hard on the inside too? Maybe kind of soft and squishy on the out on the inside. Well, for those of you, my friends, who were getting hungry earlier, what's inside a crustacean when you eat it? It's not really hard, is it? It's pretty soft, huh? So crustaceans, they have this hard shell outside their body, and their body on the inside is really soft. Oh, yeah. Another great example. So if they didn't have this hard shell, 
on the outside of their body, they just disappear. What do they look like? Well, they kind of be a little soft and squishy. It might be hard for them to stand up if they're so soft and squishy. And that's because that shell there not only gives them protection, it also gives their body structure, helps them stay up. Well, I want you to think about yourself for a minute. How does your body stay up? How does it get structure? Well, I want you to take your hands and pull, pull them back and feel something hard on the back of your back. Do you know what that is? That is your spinal cord. So us humans, the way our body has structure is our skeleton. So our skeleton is on the inside of our body. It keeps us standing up, and if we didn't have it, we'd fall down. We'd be all up and squishy, just like our crustacean friends without their shell. So when I talk about their shell giving them structure, that's because it's also their skeleton. So they have something called an exoskeleton. I am going to go write that down for you, my friends. My vocab fans here. So they have an exoskeleton. Now skeleton, we know that we have that on the inside of our body. Exo, that means their skeleton is on the outside. I always like to remember it by thinking about exiting. You exit to go outside. So the same way they have an exo outside skeleton. Now we talked about ooh, our spinal cord specifically. I had you touch that earlier. Well, as scientists, our, whether or not an animal has a spinal cord is actually super important to us. Because when we're studying animals, one big way we can categorize them, put them into groups, is by saying, hey, does this animal have a spinal cord or not? So in the case of our invertebrates, because they have an exoskeleton, they do not have a spinal cord, and that makes them invertebrates. So let's figure out this word a little bit together as well. So I, again, for the skeleton, I'm going to start with the back half of it. Vertebrate. Now that is a a scientist's way of saying spinal cord. So like I said, we have that for the vertebrae. And then in, <laughs> in just means it doesn't have one. So no spinal cord. So crustaceans, some things we learned about them so far, they have hard shells. Those shells protect them and give them structure. And they do not have a spinal cord. So Oh, you know what I mentioned earlier, when I go back to, is what happens to that shell? So I mentioned I have just the shell of a lobster friend here. Now, a lot of times, when I bring this out, and I actually like to show students, sometimes I'll get concerned students asking me, is this lobster okay? Did it die? This lobster is a okay. It did not die. We did not have to do anything to this lobster to get it. It actually got rid of this shell all on its own. So lobsters, other crustaceans, just like us, they have to grow up. They start small when they're born, and they get bigger and bigger. Well, because they have this hard shell on the outside of their body, it doesn't move that much as they grow. So after a while, after some growing, it can get kind of cramped. I know sometimes my clothes can get a little too tight, and I know, oh, I have to get some new ones. And that's kind of like how it is for our lobsters. And our other crustaceans, our crabs, our shrimps, after a little bit of growing, it gets a little too tight in here, and they figure, hey, I need to get myself a new shell. So that's when they go through a process called molting. So what they'll do is they'll actually basically wiggle their body out of their whole shell. And actually, Stewie, my friend who's been changing up all the pictures for us so far, he has a video that we can check out of one of our crabs here at the aquarium. And this is one of our crabs 
switch multiple ways. Getting rid of its old shell, it's kind of wiggling its body to get out of it. So, it is going to move its body until it gets out of that shell. Then once it does that, it doesn't have a new shell yet. So they have to grow a new one. But that process of growing a new one is going to take a few weeks. Oh, also, you know what? I want to point out one thing I forgot to mention. And that's the fact that this video is not near as slow as the real thing. So this is a video. Uh, it's about two minutes long. And it's some, a video that we've sped up. Because the actual process of our crab getting this shell off of its body, that took about 40 minutes. So we had to speed it up a lot to see it in a really short amount of time. So that just goes to show you how long this process can take for our, one of our crustaceans. Like I said, it wiggles its body out of its shell. I would like to invite you to join me to do a little bit of molting on our own. So we talked about how molting is kind of like getting clothes off. So just so you can feel what it's like to be a crab or a lobster shrimp that's molting, if you have a jacket, or maybe you can go get one, we're going to try and wiggle ourselves out of this jacket. Maybe we can finish it by the same time as our crab does. Okay. We'll try so One, two, three. Okay. I'm trying to get it off. Oh. There it goes. Now imagine doing that for 40 minutes. And you can't, not just your jacket, all of your clothes. That'd be crazy. That'd be really hard and really tiring. So like I said, after our crustaceans do all that molting, they don't have a shell yet. So they're really, really vulnerable. That means that they don't have that protection anymore. So here at the aquarium, when one of our crustaceans goes through a molt, we will put them what's called quarantine. And that's when we have animals and we can separate from the other animals for a little bit, and give them some extra attention. And their natural habitat, where they don't have humans taking care of them, when a crustacean goes through their molt, they're going to have to be really, really careful. Because all those predators, with that shell protecting them from before, are still there. Now, they don't have that protection anymore. So, our crustaceans, when they go through that molt, they might be a little bit more shy, they might hide more, and that's because that's what they would do in their natural environment. They're going to try and hide to make up for the fact they don't have protection anymore. Awesome. So, let's see, we look at another part of our crustacean's body. There was, there was another thing I saw on this that lobster, on the lobster shot earlier. I have a little. Hermit crab friend, he fell out of his shell. Oh boy, he may be a time for him to find a new shell. <laughs> um, that is actually something that happens to hermit crabs as well. They have this hard shell on the outside of the body, the red part, but on top of that, they also have this shell. So hermit crabs, they like to have an extra layer of protection. So they will look for a shell to live in. And, like our friend right here, eventually, they will get sick of that. And when that happens, they have to get rid of their shell and see if they can find a new one. Well, do they grow this new shell? Well, hermit crabs, they don't grow that shell, the white part. They actually have to look around for it. So what hermit crabs like to do, a lot of them will look for shells that are actually grown by sea so snails, they do grow these shells. So that's grow to their body. But eventually, our snails, like every other animal, will pass away and the shell will be left. And that is where our hermit crabs come in. They're going to try and find a shell that fits their body now that it's grown a little bit. And they'll grab it and take it for their new shell for protection. Ooh, it's a great example of a little hermit crab. Right there, he's doing a great job blending in with this white shell and that white sand. That's another example of an adaptation, having colors 
on their body, and I'm having to fill it on its body to blend in with its habitat. Um, in fact, here at the aquarium, in one of our Thai exhibits, we have a bunch of just empty snail shells that is leaving there just for us from a crab to just to chip, to chip it up. Let me see if I can do this. It's in this exhibit. I don't know if I'll try. Oh, there it is. Let me see if I can. So they're kind of green. But these shells, that's the ones that you'll usually see our hermit crab hanging out in. So nice and big. You can see there's two shells right next to each other. So our hermit crab will just switch off between them. So it's able to switch its shell up whenever it wants. It's a very fast little animal. Um. Uh, so, yeah, one thing I want to talk about was how our crustaceans move around. And it's really particular based on the animal. So, let's talk about, so let's just talk about our crab, how they move around. So, she has a cool video of a crab moving around. Let's go ahead and see what we can understand. I notice all those legs are moving together. One thing you might notice about our crustaceans is that their legs aren't quite like we just have legs at the hips and then at the knees. They have a lot of different parts, a lot of different segments on their legs. That's another thing that can tie our crustaceans together is these segmented legs. You know, crabs, so lobsters, shrimp, and a lot of other crustaceans. They also have five pairs of legs. Well, this is what this really in. So you may have heard before, but one interesting thing about crabs is they like to move sideways. So you went, let's try moving with a crab. Can you do that with me? So, move south and move to the side. Ooh, and you know what? As long as you have this great video, They're using a, a lot of these legs to move around, but there's some that he's not using to move around. Some that he's using to pick things up. Those are its claws. And it's another thing that a lot of the stations have. These claws, let's see if I can find it. On my lobster friend, if you see. You can see that claw right there. Ooh, awesome. These claws right there at the bottom. So they like to use these claws for lots of things. They'll use it to grab food and hey, They might use it to uh, crabs to grab something to put on its body. There are some crabs called decorator crabs. They will grab things around them and put it on their body to help it hide. They may grab that and they may even cut what they're grabbing into shape. Like, look like, like it looks like it's done with a little piece of shell. It can also use that to protect itself from predators. I know, I won't want to go grab a crab out of nowhere because I'm worried it might pinch me. So these are a great form of protection. Another example of an adaptation that our crabs have. Awesome. We talked a little about crabs and how they move. Well, they're just one crustacean. Not all crustaceans move the same way. Or let's see if we can show us a, a video of a lobster moving. See if that's similar. Maybe a little bit different. We can see right now, even though they still have a lot of different legs that are all segmented like a crab, the shape of their body is a lot different too. They also have that tail. Ooh. Let's see, I wonder if that tail will change how it moves. A lot of crab, but I don't like your crab, it is moving forward. Oh! 
Wow, did you see that? That was a pretty big jump. And you also saw at the end there, it is also moving side to side like our crab. So that's one thing that makes walking your crabs really different is that tail. It can help them actually swim a little bit. So crabs, like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, lobsters like crabs, they'll mostly crawl around. But if they need to, they have that tail that can help them move a little bit in the water. So let's see, we move like a crab. Let's move a little bit like a lobster. Let's crawl and do a pretty big jump like that lobster we just saw. And jump. All right, I'm gonna crawl back. Awesome. <gasps> All right, so we studied how crabs move around, how lobsters move around. But it's one crustacean whose movement I really want us to check out because it's super important. So, can you show us some barnacles? So. One thing you might have noticed is that there are a lot of different kinds of crustaceans. You can actually find crustaceans in, oh, the barnacles I'm looking for. So, how do you think these crustaceans might move? Hmm, well, see any legs? I don't. And that's because these crustaceans, they actually don't move at all. What they'll do is when they're little, They'll float around, they'll try to find a place to set themselves, and once they do, they'll stay there forever. So, these crustaceans don't move at all. So, let's, real quick, let's move like a barnacle. Great job. You did awesome. What else do we notice about this crustacean? Where is it? It's on land, right? So, so far, all the crustaceans that we talked about, they have been living in the water. But these ones, you see them on land, they're all dry. Well, like I said, crustaceans can live in a lot of different places. These crustaceans in particular, these barnacles, they live in tides here. So, that means they can live in the water. When the tide is high, that means the water is going up really high, covering a lot of rocks and getting close to the shore. They can also live outside of the water when the tides are low. So that means the water is coming really far, all the rocks are uncovered, and the water is far from the shore. So, during those low tide periods, barnacles, they have an adaptation, a way of surviving that helps them live even though there's no water around them. And what they'll do is they'll actually trap water in their body. They still have a little bit of water in, uh, in their body so they can survive until the water comes right back over them. Now, barnacles are also really cool. We don't only find them in tide pools. We can also find barnacles on other animals. Yeah. So if you've ever seen any of our programs about whales, if you've gone whale watching or learned about whales on your own, you might have learned that a lot of times Barnacles will attach themselves to huge whales. So, for that, they're still able to, um, so when they're attached to a whale, because they're able to live outside of water, the whale goes outside of water, maybe it's jumping, it'll be okay. And it's able to get, oh, perfect! Uh, blue and gray whales, you see all these little barnacles all over its body. So, just another example of how diverse, how different every station is, that they're even able to make their home on another animal. There's another crustacean that makes their home on another animal. So, we do have any footage or uh, a picture of a coral crab? Ooh, okay. So, this is not a coral crab, but we take a look at this crab in the meantime. When I point out its mouth, instead of having teeth like we do, it has these little mouth bits that can kind of bite things into small pieces. Like I said, it's really close right next to its 
those uh, claws so it can grab something and put it right into its mouth and it's get it as it's getting food. All right. Dude's got. Oh, whoa, whoa, crab for us. So it is actually living inside of that coral. Well, some of you might be a little confused because I know I said that this is an animal that lives on another animal. And you might look at this and say, that's not an animal at all. That's just some coral. It's like a rock, maybe a plant or something, right? Well, coral is actually an animal. So it's a teeny tiny little animal. And actually though, that hard stuff around it, that's something that builds up around its body. So it builds us up around its body and then it can become a home for other animals like our coral crab. So coral crabs, they do something really cool. They have what's called a symbiotic relationship with the coral. So that means a relationship where both the animals are working together, they need each other, and a lot of times they're both benefiting in some way. So in this situation, the crab, it lives in the coral, it gets a home. Coral is really hard and has a lot of small spaces. So for a predator that might want to eat this crab, it can be hard to get into those small spaces and eat that crab. So it's a great home for a small crab like this little coral crab. And the coral crab, it will actually help keep the coral clean. It'll eat debris on it. So they're both benefiting some way from this relationship. So we talked a little bit about crustaceans that live in a tide pool or barnacles. Um, you know those hermit crabs? You can also find a lot of hermit crabs in tide pools as well. They live right next to where the sea snails are, so it makes sense that they're going to be there as well. And we've talked about crabs that live in coral reefs. Well, you can find cra uh, crustaceans that live in pretty much every habitat. But let's talk about what that word is real quick. So a habitat, that's just any place where an animal lives. It's where it makes its home. So this right here, we're looking at tide pool habitat. So what are some other habitats where we can find crustaceans? Well, we have our tough forest habitats here in Southern California. And there, that's where we can find what's called a cope crab. So she's going to find a picture for us for of a kelp crab. And we're going to have you look at it a little bit and see if you can figure out what its adaptation is. What help, what's something that helps it survive in the kelp forest. So that is our kelp crab. It's hanging out in some of the kelp. So I talked a little bit about how sometimes an adaptation can just be simply the color of an animal's body. So in this photo, because of the flash of the camera, our kelp crab is actually being colored pretty well. We can see it's the same color as the kelp that it's in. So that helps our kelp crab uh, hide in the kelp, survive, it can help it get food, it can help it protect itself from other predators. So this is another great example of an adaptation. Another really important animal in the kelp forest is a spiny lobster. So spiny lobsters. Ooh, yeah, we looked at that trend earlier. So what is so important about a spiny lobster? Well, it's what they eat. So they eat shit. <laughs> and one thing that's happening right now is that in our kelp forest, because we know otters are used most of the urchins, we have way more urchins than our kelp forest can handle right now. So urchins, they eat the kelp. So they're getting a lot of kelp. So those forests are disappearing. So other animals that can eat urchins are really important right now, like a spiny lobster. They can help kind of keep those urchin populations in check. We almost done. You know, I want to talk about one more crustacean, and that is one you might not even think of. 
So we talked about crustaceans earlier about how we like to eat them, but a lot of other animals like to eat them too. And this is a crustacean that's really important for other animals to eat. These are krill. So these are teeny tiny animals. They're called plankton. They're not big enough to move against the current of the water. Uh, you can find big plankton too. But yeah, so these small animals are actually food for uh, whales. So this is just an example of all the wide range of crustaceans we have in our oceans. So I'm so happy I got to learn about the, oh, yep, that's one of our whales uh, that eats the crustaceans. They'll open their mouth, try and get a bunch of water in their mouth, and because the, plank, the krill is so small, they'll all come into its mouth, and then it shoots its up. The water out, it keeps all the krill in its mouth. So that is it for our program. Thank you so much for joining us. I had a great time talking about crustaceans with you, and I hope to see you at one of our other AOAs. I hope you have a great day.